Okay, should we? Okay. The next talk is locally updatable, updatable and decodable uh, code. But Nishant uh, Chandra, Bhavna Kanukurti. Bhavna Kanukurti. And Rafi Ostrovsky, <laughs> and Bhavna will give the talk. Okay. Um, thank you all for hanging around, even though this is the last talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about locally updatable and locally decodable codes. Um, and this is joint work with Nishan Chandran and Rafael Ostrowski. OK, so we've heard enough about codes. We all know what error correcting codes are. But just to make sure we have the notation uh, clear, you know, error correcting codes basically have an encode and decode procedure. The encode procedure takes the message and outputs the code word. And the decode procedure will take a potentially corrupted code word. And the guarantee is that as long as not too many um, errors take place, not too many corruptions take place, the decoder will decode the original message. And in particular, as long as the dis uh, distance between C and C prime is at most delta n, so at most a constant fraction errors have been made, we, the decoder will decode to the original message. And you know, there's a lot of great research, and we know that coding theory is extremely important and uh, uh, have, has very good applications and things like that. But an important downside is that they necessarily have to read the entire message or the code word, respectively, when they want to encode or decode. And this is a big problem. And what we want to ask is, can we do better? Now, this question has already been asked for the, you know, uh, in the context of uh, decoding. And in particular, Katz and Trevisan in Stock 2000 introduced the notion of locally decodable codes, which guarantee that you can decode specific bits of the, recover specific bits of the message by accessing only a few bits of the code word. So in particular, a locally decodable code is a regular error correcting code, which also has a randomized decode procedure, which recovers the ith index of the message by reading just Q symbols of the code word. Okay. And the decodability guarantee that we have is that as long as only a constant fraction of errors take place, then this decoder will be able to, on receiving an input i, will be able to retrieve m of i with some probability. And the terminology locality is used to denote the number of symbols of the code word that the decoder accesses to recover a bit of the message. Okay. And uh, again, a lot of research has gone on into building um, locally decodable codes with good parameters. Yakanin has a a uh, really good survey on this topic. And uh, more recently, and uh, the works of Koperti et al., Hemingway et al., and Guo et al. actually build uh, locally decodable codes, which get constant rate, um, which means the length of the code word is linear in uh, the message and sublinear locality. And today we want to ask, what about the encoding process? Can we do something similar? for encoding. Ideally, what would we like? We'd like to have some similar to how locally decodable codes had a randomized decode procedure. We'd like to have a randomized update procedure, which would update some specific bit of the message by touching only a few symbols of the code word, by rewriting only a few symbols of the code word. So in particular, we'd like to have an update algorithm, which takes in as input an index and the bit that you want to set modify just a few bits, few symbols of the code word. And then the decode algorithm should give you back the same message, except with the i bit set to whatever you want it to be. And so this is what we want. And in particular, what we would like to get is similar to locally uh, decodable codes. We want to get constant rate, sublinear locality, sublinear write locality. And we want to tolerate a constant fraction of errors. Now, quite a few of you are probably already skeptical at this point of time, and you're wondering how this is even possible. And in fact, this is actually impossible in its full generality. And the challenge is the following. When we say we want local updatability, what we want is that for any two co code words of neighboring messages, basically messages that differ in just one bit, we want to make sure that the code words differ only in a sublinear number of positions. 
Now, this contradicts with the goal of error tolerance, where you say that you know you should be able to tolerate a constant fraction of errors. So, therefore, that necessarily requires that the code words are different at least in the linear position positions, right? So, there is an inherent contradiction here. And in particular, if you take this very simple uh, counter example, we can see that it actually you cannot get such codes. So, for instance, you just encode uh, the message, and then suppose the update algorithm flips certain bits. Now, if your adversary goes ahead and flips exactly the bits that were updated, then the decode procedure is going to decode to the original message. So, clearly, there is a, a conflict over here. So, what we want to do is to come up with the reason why we have this impossibility is because this is a very strong error model. We're allowing the adversary to do a lot. And what we want to do is to restrict the adversary to prevent such attacks. And that is what we're going to talk about today. But before we do that, let me just give you a quick outline. I'll start by talking, uh, uh, giving you the definition of an LULDC code. And then I'll give you an overview of our corruption model. And finally, uh, the, you know, our, we call it the prefix Hamming metric. And I gi I'll give you a construction of uh, uh, an LULDC code for the prefix havoc metric. And finally, I'll uh, you know, give you a very quick overview of how our proof of retrievability construction works. OK, so let's start with the definition. Now, this is a very natural definition. It's what you would expect it to be. I'm going to keep things a little informal. Um, OK, so what do you want from updatability? You want to make sure that when you have some code word, it could potentially be even corrupted. As long as a code word decodes to a particular message, we call it empty, then you should be able to update it to something that decodes to a neighboring message. So when you update it, it could potentially update to a corrupted code word. That's fine. But the constraint that you have, the condition that you want to satisfy is that it should decode to the neighboring message, which we'll call empty plus one. And the uh, property that we want is that this update algorithm should actually touch very few bits. And in particular, you want the locality to be sublinear. Okay. And decodability is the same as before. You want to be able to locally decode to the latest message from a potentially corrupted close code word. And again, you want the decode locality also to be sublinear. So in short, our goal is to get a constant rate error correcting code with sublinear update locality, sublinear decode locality, and which tolerates a constant fraction of errors. Of course, it's impossible if the adversary makes arbitrary errors. So the, for a suitable error model, we want to be able to build such codes. And as I said, today we'll talk about the prefix Hamming error model. Okay. So let's go back to this picture and see why you know, we had this impossibility result in the first place. As we know, the main challenge is that the adversary could go ahead and flip the bits that were recently updated. And what we wanted to do is to prevent such attacks. So what is the idea? We'll allow the adversary to make a constant fraction of errors, but we will allow him to corrupt only a few of the recently updated bits so that we can prevent this attack. Okay. So we're going to allow the adversary to only corrupt a constant fraction, in particular a constant fraction of the recently changed bits. And the way we do this is by using a notion called age for different code word symbols. That's how we uh, keep track of the uh, time. Now, an age of a code word symbol is going to capture when it was last modified. And it's relative. Think of it as a relative ordering with other symbols of the code word. Let's just take a picture. So when you have a code word, we'll you know, use the darker colors to denote the symbols that were most recently written. The lighter ones denote older symbols. They faded away with time. And now, as a code word gets rewritten on the system, the ages of respective of various symbols are going to change. 
and uh, now we want to use this notion of age of the different symbols to de define our prefix Hamming metric. Okay, so as I said in a prefix Hamming metric, we still want to allow the adversary to make a constant fraction of errors, but he should only corrupt a constant fraction of the t most recently changed bits. So in particular, we will use this notion of age ordering, the notation is age ordering of the code word and some time frame, time period and that is going to denote the t most recently updated bits of the code word. Now, this t is going to vary from 1 to n. So, when you look at the age ordering of n, you know, going up to n, it is basically going to give you the relative ordering of all of the code word symbols of the n most recently updated distinct symbols. Okay. So, now you say that, you know, they have, it satisfies the prefix Hamming metric if the prefix distance between c and c prime is at most delta n, by which we mean that when you look at the age ordering, um, of c comma t and you look at the Hamming distance of that from the corresponding t bits of a corrupted code word, then that distance has to be at most delta, delta factor, delta t. Okay. So, in case this was not very clear, what age ordering gives you is some indices. So, age ordering of c comma 1 gives you the most recently updated code word bit, age ordering of c comma 2 gives you the two most recently updated code word bits, the symbols corresponding to it. So, when you want to see how a code word was corrupted, you basically compare the Hamming distance of the age ordering of uh, that particular code word to the corresponding bits, corresponding indices in your corrupted code word. Okay. And uh, I just like to point out for those of you who are familiar with uh, Shulman's work on uh, tree codes that this is very similar in spirit to uh, Shulman's prefix condition. And one of the motivations for considering a metric like this is that, you know, when you talk about physical bits, they are going to degrade with time. And the idea is that the longer a bit resides in memory, the more likely that it is faded away, the more likely that there are errors. So, that is what it tries to capture. And if a bit was written recently, then it will have fewer errors, because it was written and accessed just recently. Okay, so now let me go ahead with the construction for LULDC. Before that, let's just take a quick look at the parameters that we get. So our binary LULDCs for prefix Hamming corruptions have constant rate. They have an update locality of log square k and a decode locality of k to the epsilon. And uh, we're able to improve the decode locality to lambda log square k, where lambda is the security parameter by moving to the computational setting. Um, the, so, in case the prefix Hamming metric was a little hard to follow, with the rest of the talk we are going to move to an intermediary metric called the buffered Hamming and I will explain what that is. So, I will tell you about buffered Hamming metric and then I will give you our construction for our LULDC and then I will also give you um, some high level overview of how to go from the buffered Hamming metric to the prefix Hamming metric. Okay. So, now in the buffered Hamming metric, you view the code word as consisting of blocks or buffers and the constraint that you have here is that not too many corruptions have taken place in any particular buffer. So, for instance, suppose you have, you know, the code word C uh, from C1 through CL, you view it as consisting of buffers of various sizes okay. and you say that the buffer distance between two code words is at most a factor delta, it is at most delta n. If for all of the buffers, there are at most delta factor corruptions. Okay. So, you look at each of the buffers and at most a constant fraction of each of the buffers have been corrupted. Then you say it has a buffer distance of delta n. And what we are going to focus on is constructions for this metric. And uh, the way we will go about it is by using some techniques from oblivious RAM. So, let me give you a quick overview of that. And in particular, we actually are not going to use oblivious RAM in its full glory. We are instead just going to use the hierarchical data structure, um, which was introduced by Ostrowski in the context of oblivious RAMs. And oblivious RAMs give you an efficient way to store and retrieve data. 
And here I'm just going to describe the data structure that we use. So we have buffers. Data is organized in multiple buffers, in particular log level buffers. And in each level, whenever I store an element, I store two to the i elements in each level. And whenever I store an element, I store it in the form of index comma value. So to store this data, m0 through m k minus 1, initially when I store it, I store the entire data into the last buffer. And then subsequently, as I keep modifying the data, I'm going to write to this data structure. And the whole point is that it's going to help me update and retrieve data in an easy manner. OK, so the way ORAM works, this, this data structure works, is that we're going to rewrite elements starting from the top level. And every, of course, if you keep rewriting it, you'll see that the buffers are going to get filled. So we need to make room for more data to come in. So every two to the i steps, we're going to merge the first i minus uh, one levels into the ith level. So we're going to merge all the data into the ith level. And then when we want to search for some particular index in this data structure, we go from top to bottom. And the first time we find that element i with the index i, that will be the latest value. OK, so now we want to use this data structure to get an LULDC. So what we're going to do is simply to encode each level. So we're going to use store data in this data structure. And then we're going to encode each level with an error correcting code. So now to decode, we're going to scan from top to bottom. We're going to decode each code word and scan from top to bottom. And the first occurrence of the index i is going to be the most recent value. And technically, this is an LULDC. But unfortunately, the decode locality, as you can see, is linear. And the reason for this is that we're not really using locally decodable codes anywhere. And we have constructions of locally decodable codes that we want to use. So what we're going to do, the first change, is that we're going to encode each level with a locally decodable code. But this still doesn't work, because how do we check if some index is found at a particular level? without decoding the entire code word. Now to fix that, we'll store, every time we store something in a buffer, we store a particular data in a particular level, we're going to sort the entire buffer before we encode it. So now we can just, once we do that, we can just decode and find, look for a particular level by doing a binary search on the underlying message in each level. Um, so as you can see, we have a logarithmic number of levels, and we're uh, reading a logarithmic number of elements at each level. And each element, since it has an address and a value, it has uh, length log k. Um, the paper has more details about a general theorem uh, for the parameters. But um, using the codes of Koparthi et al., we basically get decode locality of k to the epsilon. And uh, our update locality is log square k. I won't get into too many details, but you know, at a very high level, um, when you work through it, you'll see that if you have two to the j updates, then you're roughly rewriting l times uh, buffer uh, zero number of bits. Each l is the uh, number of levels. It's logarithmic. So if you just work it out, it comes out to log square k. This is an amortized guarantee, but for the buffered Hamming metric, we can also make it worst case. And uh, the rate of the code, as I've given here, is k times log k, because we have log k levels each with uh, two to the i elements of length log k. But that can be made constant rate by playing around with the number of levels and uh, adjusting it a little bit. OK. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of how to go from buffer to prefix Hamming, but at a very, very high level, the idea is that the buffered Hamming, because the buffers are of a specific um, size, and because you write into the buffers in some way that depends on the time in which the bits are written, you're actually able to go from the buffer to the prefix Hamming metric. And because each of the buffers are, you know, the smaller buffers are twice as long as the uh, subsequent buffers, you're able to lose only a constant factor when you go to the prefix Hamming metric. Um, OK, so for the prefix Hamming metric, we're able to get a constant rate code with amortized update locality of log square k and a decode locality k to the epsilon. And uh, we are able to improve the decode locality 
from uh, k to the epsilon to something much better. I'll give you the parameters in a bit by going to the computational setting. So for the lack of time, I won't talk too much about this. But roughly, the computational uh, construction for the computational setting works by combining computational uh, locally decodable codes and hash functions. So instead of using a binary search, instead of storing the data in a sorted manner, you can use hash functions. And uh, by using, you need additional tricks with constant size max um, to get, you know, to really improve the parameters. OK, so let me, in the very limited time that I have, tell, give you a quick overview of our result on dynamic proof of retrievability. OK, so the uh, a proof of retrievability scheme, essentially introduced by Jules and Kaliski, essentially have, has an audit protocol that allows a client to check whether the server has all the data it's stored on it. So all, you know, the client has stored some data. All it wants to know at any given point of time is, is all my data there or not? And it uses an audit protocol to check this. And uh, you know, in this very nice work of uh, Cash, Kupcho, and Wix, they build a dynamic POR. Uh, which basically considers the case where the data is changing. And uh, their protocol basically uh, shows that if you have an ORAM scheme with some uh, property called the next pattern, next read pattern hiding, then you can use that, use such ORAM schemes to get a dynamic POR construction. So because of that, their construction is fairly involved. And uh, on the other hand, we basically use techniques similar to what I just described to get a more direct construction using just the hierarchical data structure. And so this simplifies our uh, construction and also improves the parameters that we get. Um, so at a very high level, we're going to use the same hierarchical data structure as before. But instead now, the you know, main idea is that we use a static POR in each level. So. Um, when we up, so you know we have the plain data on one side, and we have the encoded buffer. Uh, you know, a buffer encode. You know, the, everything on the left is encoded with a standard error correcting code. That's essentially a static POR. And uh, to update, we just uh, change the value on the left, and then we re-encode the appropriate buffers on the right. And the main thing is the audit protocol here. The audit protocol works by checking lambda positions, lambda bits of the code word at each level. Um, we also map all the data bit by bit. So we're going to check those maths. And if any of the math value fails, we will reject. And read proceeds naturally. OK, so to conclude, we introduced and presented constructions for locally updatable and locally decodable codes in the prefix Hamming metric. And we were able to get dynamic proofs of retrievability uh, scheme with, an, with improved parameters. And uh, I think the most interesting uh, open questions are to build LULDCs for other metrics to obtain LULDCs that are more efficient. And uh, I think proofs of retrievability are very important in practice. So trying to understand the practical efficiency of this and seeing how fast it runs, I think that also would be a very interesting thing to do. Thank you.